You've probably seen some of these Victorian and Edwardian photos of women with ridiculously long hair. And perhaps some of the clickbaity headlines about said photos. It's tempting to look at these and assume everyone in the past could and did grow their hair super long. Was there some kind of magical secret? Did historical hair routines let everyone grow their hair this long? Well, yes, maybe. But not quite. There was a reason people took photos of hair like this. It was the exception, not the norm. While it's less common today on account of us having more fashionable options for how to wear hair, some people do still grow their hair super long. By way of example, please see these photos of my gorgeous friend Courtney and her super long hair. I could go on at length about the social context of these photos, the tricks people use to fake extremely long and thick hair, the struggle of recreating hairstyles from historical sources, but you're probably not here for that. You're here because you searched for hair growth advice, right? Or because you already know me and like listening to me snark. For those of you who do not yet know me, I'm V, fashion historian who used to work as a hairdresser, so this is like both my careers at once. There's a lot we can learn from history, whether that's about hair care or anything else. My favorite thing to do is sort through it all to find the myths, the facts, and what we can bring back into the modern world. If you enjoy fashion history and hairstyling class, please do consider supporting me over on Patreon. It helps me keep creating these videos and making them available to everyone for free. And hitting the subscribe button is always helpful too. Normally Snarky Pajama V would be the one telling you that, but she's unavailable today, so you're stuck with me. So why is hair growth such a big deal? Well, lots of people want to have long hair. Lots of people find it really good looking on themselves. Lots of people find it really good looking on others. Of course, that can lead to some not so great societal pressures that entire demographics of people ought to only wear their hair long, that long hair is automatically more attractive, and other such nonsense. We don't like those pressures much in this house. It is the position of this channel that everyone should be able to wear their hair at whatever length makes them happiest. Long hair can serve a practical purpose too. I literally find it easier to have long hair than short. There are certain things you can do with long hair that don't work otherwise. My chin length bob required much more upkeep than my current waist length hair. But here's why I actually think it's become such a big deal. Hair growth is slow. Hair grows out of your head at whatever speed it grows and influencing that is hard. Hence, people and hair care companies make a lot of fuss and try a lot of things to make it go faster. Excuse me, can we go get breakfast, please? Hey, I'm still filming. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a friend visiting, which means that the rest of this couch is actually a bed right now. Perks of my new house. I get to turn my living room into a guest room. And our sponsor, Brooklinen, sent me a bonus set of sheets for the guest bed. Brooklinen makes high quality home textiles that are actually worth what they cost. If you want to stock up on bedding and bath essentials for 2023, Brooklinen is giving my viewers $20 off any order over 100 using my code SNAPPYDRAGON at checkout. Use the link in my description. Textiles like bed sheets take a lot of resources to produce. So you want what you buy to last you a long time and to get softer and cozier throughout their lifetime. Brooklinen offers a great variety of materials, colors, and patterns. So there's something to suit everyone's preferences and aesthetic. My personal ride or die are their linen sheets. I've slept in them for over a year and they have thoroughly spoiled me for getting bedding or towels anywhere else but linen's not for everyone, so I'm really happy they've started making organic cotton ones too. The organic hardcore sheet bundle includes a sheet set, duvet cover, and extra pillowcases, and costs 25% less than buying the same items individually. You can mix and match colors and sizes too. These sheets are GOTS certified, meaning the materials are grown organically and meet environmental and socially responsible standards. And they're super smooth and comfy thanks to a 100% organic cotton woven into 300 thread count fabric. Now, I can't tell you what it's like to sleep in them since this isn't my bed, but... Hey, Sarah, how'd you sleep last night? Whee! <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so how do you sleep? I slept super fantastic, especially since I don't sleep super great on vacation. So this was excellent. And what'd you think of the bed sheets? They were super comfy, they were lightweight, they're pretty, they were nice temperature regulation, and it, it gets was you hot on the lovely. stupid third floor apartment. They were not too hot on a third floor apartment building. Yay! It was lovely. Then again, she can nap literally anywhere, so I don't know how meaningful that is. Excuse you, I just said I sleep like crap on vacation. 
Hey, let me get back to filming! <laughs> Ruin my nap! So what does historical hair care have to do with anything? As it turns out, many historical hair care practices are amazing for hair growth. But to explain why, we gotta talk about what we mean by hair growth. Time to be a good little historian slash hairdresser and define our terms. On average, human hair grows out of the head at a speed of roughly half an inch a month. This is the attitude taught by trichology, and it holds true with what I've seen on my own head and the heads of my clients when I did hair full time. It's super easy to track this on people who color their hair all over because you can see the regrowth and measure against how many weeks since the color was done. Now, hair growing out of the head is dependent on the internal workings of the body. That's medicine not hairstyling or history, and I am not qualified to speak about it in detail. Various factors, stress, illness, pregnancy and childbirth, hormonal things like pattern balding, can reduce hair growth or cause hair to fall out, but these influence density more than speed and are better addressed with a medical professional than a stylist. Various treatments can supposedly improve hair growth, vitamins and supplements, scalp massage, topical products, medical procedures for baldness, but with the exception of certain medical treatments for hair loss, how well they work on the speed of hair growth ranges from worth a shot, maybe if it's not too expensive, to snake oil to that's potentially dangerous. You generally can't do much to influence the speed your hair grows out of your head, and that's one of the things that makes people try so hard. But what what you can influence is how much of that hair you get to keep. Hair is a fiber, susceptible to wear and tear and breakage. Given it grows at a set pace, if you want to make it longer, you need to keep as much of it as you can and stop it from breaking off or splitting. This is what historical hair care methods can really help with. Most of these won't do anything to make your hair grow out of your head faster because there's very little you can be sure will do that. They are, however, super effective for keeping hair healthy and reducing breakage. Thing one. Don't overwash your hair. I've done a video already on the late 20th century phenomenon of daily hair washing and how it became the norm in Western hair care. The short version is, Overwashing hair with shampoo or detergents can dry it out, leading to more breakage. The product we know as shampoo is just shy of a century old, and washing hair with soap on a regular basis only took off in Western fashion in the later decades of the 19th century, when it was more of a monthly process. Everything from medieval twice a day combing with a very fine tooth comb to 18th century hair powder was a way of keeping hair clean without using water and suds. You can work these methods into a more modern routine if you want to stretch out the time between washings. If your hair takes well to brushing, you can brush your hair and scalp gently but thoroughly twice a day to exfoliate the skin and distribute the natural oils. A good dry shampoo, or some 18th century reproduction hair powder, can absorb excess oil and add some volume. Thing two, braiding. Braiding is amazing for keeping hair protected from tangles and breakage. I am actually struggling to think of a region of the world that does not have some tradition of braiding hair when hair was worn long. Tell me in the comments about how people from your culture have used braids, or if you're from a culture where braids weren't used. A lot of these cultural practices have great significance and are not for just anyone to try. Please see this other video for an example of a braiding tradition whose history has been distorted. Part of why braids are so useful is that hair can't tangle as easily when it's in a braid. The structure of the braid holds hairs in alignment with each other. The hair is less damaged by tangling and less tension is needed to untangle when the braid comes out. Also, human hair is a fiber. So it follows many of the same principles of wool or hemp or cotton. Combine lots of little fibers, you get something much stronger than the individuals, like twisting rope or spinning wool into yarn. With the strands of hair all supporting each other, the force of any given movement is distributed and hair is less likely to break. The braid also physically protects most of the strands of hair from outside damage by putting them under other strands. Anything not on the surface can't really be touched. Certain types of hair are especially well served by certain types of braiding. A general rule is that the curlier the hair is, the more prone it is to breakage because each bend is a structural weak point. So curlier hair tends to benefit even more from styles that protect the hair, like braids. 
Everyone who's learned curly hair care like me owes a massive debt of gratitude to black people who have literal millennia of practice developing protective styles and braiding techniques for extremely curly and delicate hair textures. Once again, many of these styles and methods have great cultural significance and are not for just anyone to do or wear. Rather, we should admire the artistry and ingenuity, learn from the foundational principles, and find ways to incorporate that knowledge into hair care practices that are ours to use. My friend Jackie, another hair care historian, made a video with me last year about some cool looking braids from European history. Go check that out if you want some inspiration. Other pinned up styles can protect hair in many of the same ways that braids do. Most updos, even simple buns, group hair together, prevent tangles, and secure it to keep it out of the way and protect it from breakage. They also reduce wear and tear on the ends, the part of the hair that's oldest and most worn down where breakage is likely. Yes, a lot of cultures in Europe and around the Mediterranean came to associate the pinning up of hair with modesty, but it started out as utility. Which brings me to thing three. Another practice that started out as utility and became associated with modesty, headscarves. Tons of cultures have traditions of covering hair with scarves, kerchiefs, wraps, cloth caps, and other similar accessories because it works really well. If your hair is wrapped and covered, the outside world can't cause it to break, tangle, or get dirty. Not only are your ends protected by the bun or braid or whatever style is under the headscarf, the scarf itself is protecting them from sun, dry air, and mechanical damage. Plus, the fabric covering was often something that absorbed excess oil and kept the hair cleaner that way too. So we're talking everything from hijabs to bandanas to 18th and 19th century mob caps help serve this function. For instance, in my culture, many Jewish women would traditionally wear a tichel after getting married. It started out as a common practice and therefore a social norm back in the Bronze Age, there's that utility angle, and became associated with religion and modesty and reserving the sight of your gorgeous hair for your husband. If that's meaningful for someone, great. But I am not a fan of dictating ideas about modesty to others, especially along gender lines. It's each person's choice if they want to show their hair or not and what that means to them. There's been some movement among Jewish folks to wear techels on our own terms without the patriarchal reasoning. So there are lots of Jews like me who wear them regardless of being married or not, or who only wear them sometimes or wear them for reasons that have nothing to do with patriarchal ideas about modesty and partnership. What I personally like tichels for is for when my curls have gotten messy, but I'm not ready to go through my whole washing process yet. Ordinarily, I'd either need to spend time doing an interesting braid or throw my hair up in a plain bun and miss having something cool looking and artistic on my head. A pretty scarf can take the place of hair that way. My current favorite is this one from the Crown Collection by Elke Rivasudin. It's got absolutely gorgeous art on it. It's a robin's egg blue that goes with most of my clothes and is a really soft silk rayon blend. I'll drop a link in the description and there will be some more photos of it on Instagram. I also highly recommend using veil pins for more artistic draping options. Mine are from my dear friend Opus L and I, but you can make your own or even use sewing pins. Silk pins are good for very fine scarves, like the 100% version of Elka's designs. The same cautions about cultural appropriation apply when it comes to headscarf styles. I would not wear this scarf in any specific style that has significance to a culture I don't come from, but I would absolutely learn from the amazing draping and pinning skills that many Muslims use for their hijabs and then use that learning to make my techel draping stay put better. Does this mean that historical hair care is the magic bullet for hair growth? And what if you don't want to wear your hair braided or covered all the time? Well, for one thing, there is no such thing as a magic bullet for hair growth. Historical hair care gives us more tools, some of which are very effective, but it's not going to solve every one of every person's hair care woes. Historical hair care was the best people could figure out in the context of their times and circumstances, but we have actually come up with some cool things since the Middle Ages, like conditioner. Many historical hair care methods relied on moisturizing hair with oil, from combing the scalp's natural oils through hair to applying plant oil or sometimes animal fats. This is certainly better than ignoring one's hair, but conditioners can be a lot more effective. Oils and fats are emollients, which in hair care are used to coat the hair strand and prevent moisture from evaporating. They do moisturize, but only in a limited way and can make hair greasy. 
A good hair conditioner also hydrates using humectants, ingredients that draw water in, keeping the hair strand more supple and flexible rather than brittle. Not every conditioner is a good conditioner, but chances are your hair is better off with conditioner than without. Another modern invention I am very much a fan of, health trims. I recognize the seeming irony of telling you to cut your hair to get it longer, and I thoroughly reject the myth that cutting hair makes it grow faster. It doesn't. Nothing you do to your already grown hair will change the speed at which it grows out of your head. What health trims do is remove the oldest, most worn down, brittle, split and breakage prone hair at the ends. So the rest remains healthy and you get to keep as much of what you grow as possible. A health trim can remove as little as a quarter or a half inch of hair, two weeks to a month of growth. This does not mean cutting hair with any old sharp implement. Hairdressing scissors are carefully made and frequently sharpened to cleanly cut hair strands. Using dull scissors can actually cause more split ends and damage because they don't cut the hair strand, they snap it, leaving an uneven break and lots of cracks in the outer layers, which will lead to more tangles and splits. I recommend getting your hair trimmed once a year at the absolute minimum. And for most people, it's best to do it between two and four times a year. If your goal is growth, you want to get into a routine where you take a tiny bit off the ends before they get brittle and fragile, so you can trim the absolute minimum and not lose any length to breakage. The reality is, lots of us don't want to wear our hair in historical styles all the time. In fact, many people who want to grow their hair longer wish to do so specifically because they like how it looks when it's down or out or otherwise on display. Historical methods were intended for historical context. They don't necessarily play well with modern goals. So you do have to pick and choose and combine to figure out what works for you based on your goals and your hair type and your lifestyle, which is the entire point. There is no one magic method from this time or any other that will make your hair grow a foot overnight. But the joy of studying history is you, you get thousands of years of humanity's cleverness and adaptability to learn different methods from, then work out something that's just right for you. You're not restricted only to current or local fashions or knowledge. Whenever I talk about hair care, I get a lot of people asking me to share my routine, usually meaning the products I use. But here's the thing, my hair is not the same as your hair. Everyone's hair is different. There is no one product or method that will work for every person. So the products I use in the combination I use them in won't necessarily work for anyone else's hair. My routine isn't useful information if copied exactly. But I do want to give an example of integrating historical methods into a routine for modern use. So here you go. I wash my hair once a week, a frequency most common in Western fashion in the earlier half of the 20th century. Some hair likes more, some hair likes less. You just have to find what's right for you. I use a very gentle shampoo, a modern invention. So happy we've invented cleansing molecules that are gentler than soap or sulfates. I use lots of conditioner, I don't rinse it out, and I load my hair up with a combination of styling product and oil while soaking wet. Pretty straightforward curl care stuff. I've practiced and noticed what products and techniques work for me. You should do the same for your hair. I air dry my hair, preferably outside in the fresh air, much faster and no heat damage. This is also an old method as hair dryers are, in the grand scheme of things, a very new invention. I like to wear my hair loose or half up for the first few days, then I'll braid it or put it up when it starts to get frizzy and the curls get less defined. This can be everything from loosely winding it up and sticking my big medieval reproduction hairpins in it, to modern braids. I like how rope braids look on me, to full on historical two braids wrapped around the head and covered with a scarf or tickle. Last year, I did a month long experiment where I stuck fully to historical hair care methods, didn't wash my hair at all and kept it braided and or covered at all times. I didn't find it was more or less healthy afterwards, but given that my old house didn't have hot water for two of those four weeks, it sure made life easier. I hope these methods help you take care of your hair in whatever way suits you best. Tell us in the comments about your favorite historical or traditional hair care technique. I love when my comment section turns into a place to swap hair tips, so maybe you'll inspire or be inspired by someone else. Do remember to click the button to tell YouTube you liked what you saw, and subscribe for your regularly scheduled dose of fashion history sass. You can find me around the internet at Miss Snappy Dragon on Instagram, Facebook, and very occasionally TikTok, and on patreon.com slash Snappy Dragon Studios. Now, I gotta go deal with a Sarah interrupting hey, me. I, I was perfectly nice about that interruption. <laughs>
You were very nice, but I am still filming. Perhaps you'd like to check out this playlist of my historical hair videos, or this gigantic documentary series I just did. Thanks to Brooklyn Inn for making sure Sarah and I both get good sleep during our weekend of adventures. Brooklyn Inn is giving my viewers $20 off any order over $100 using my code SNAPPYDRAGON at checkout. Use the link in my description. See you next time. <laughs>